welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. Today, I wanted to talk about habits that feed self-criticism. And I wanted to start off by saying hi to my stroke survivor and caregiver support group at Inova Loudon Hospital. I got to um, join all of you today. And what I took away from my stroke survivor support group was that a positive attitude is everything. And it was very inspiring to sit and listen to so many people with various deficits as a result of their strokes and everyone coming together, sharing with each other. And we even had a gentleman who um, manages what is called the Brain Choir, and it's uh, integrating music with stroke recovery, stroke and brain injury recovery. And um, and folks were cl- clapping for each other and laughing, and we each uh, got to, I almost said had to, we got to sing a little bit. Uh, I even did it virtually. So um, yes, I participated, <laughs> um, but I didn't until I was called on, of course. Um, anyway, it was just, it was encouraging, and um, I'm glad that I'm a part of it. Um, just to plug the group in case there are other stroke survivors or caregivers out there that are interested in um, building their network and being a part of something bigger than yourself, it's it's beneficial for sure. Um, the group meets every second Wednesday of the month, and um, it's from 11 to noon, and for more information... Uh, you can email um, an individual named Jill, and I'll provide her email in the description of the episode today. So um, I have been feeling, quite honestly, a bit poopy over the past few days. I've just been feeling discouraged. I've been feeling sorry for myself. And I've been feeling like I just, you know, I can't remember to do this. And um, I have a hard time talking about this, like finding the words for this and that. And, and today I went to that support group and then I, it was just terrible for my head. It was terrible. I tried to look away from the computer as much as possible, but it's just... It, it hasn't improved at all. Not at all. You know, I, when I think that my head is doing better, I try these types of things and it just feels just like it did six months ago when I do it. So it, that's not improvement to me. It's, I'm avoiding triggers. That's what I'm doing in order to not feel the pain and the discomfort. So um, closing my eyes a lot today, um, and just kind of softening my gaze and relaxing my brain and trying to get that rubber band wrapped around my head to go away. But, um, I did shed some tears today, which is a little unusual for me. It, uh, I took, I had taken Autumn outside to go to the bathroom and she saw another dog and she like took off running towards the dog and I had her on a long leash. I don't know why I keep doing that, but um, today's the last day I'm going to do that. She needs to be on a normal leash. And she took off running and um, just yanked my arm, you know, and So I'll probably feel some pain in my arm now tomorrow, but we came back inside. I was really frustrated and I just went into the bathroom and just shed some tears in there for a few minutes. So, um, it's normal, you know, I, if I didn't shed some tears during all of this that I'm going through, then I would think there's something wrong with me, you know? So it's okay. It's totally fine. 
don't feel sorry. It's, I think, the natural human um, reaction to the stress that I'm undergoing physically and mentally, you know? So, okay, with that, I'm going to shift gears and we're going to talk about habits that feed self-criticism. And I think this is a healthy thing to talk about today. So self-criticism comes naturally for me. Can you tell? And um, so I have four habits that I have recorded with some details on things that come naturally to me that um, that are bad for me, like that self-talk that's bad for me, that if I keep doing it, feed this um, more general self-criticism. So I think that there's a fine line between being humble and crossing over into being unaccepting of compliments or not acknowledging in ourselves the strengths and talents that others see in us. And I think that when we cross that fine line, we are inviting self-criticism into our lives. Anything we practice often enough becomes a habit. It just does, um, whether we want it to or not. And today I want to talk about those habits and how they nurture self-criticism. Habits that we may not even be aware of that we do. Or we may be aware of them and find it difficult to change. So there's four of them that I have put together for you today. Number one, let's talk about downplaying our strengths and talents. So I am a good communicator, okay? I, I believe that about myself. Like if I put all of my emotions and self-criticism to the side, I can tell you that I am a good communicator. I know that. It's one of my values. I work hard at listening and articulating my thoughts and um, it's something that I heavily focused on at work. It wasn't in my job description. I actually tried to get it in my job description. I was actually trying to convince my boss and, uh, and the powers that be to change the name of my department from marketing to communications because I felt that that's what we were doing. And um, I did not get approved for that, unfortunately. But still the same, we, that's what we did. We communicated, and I was good at it. I was good at speaking communication, written communication. So, But when I say it, like I'm saying it right now, saying it out loud, it feels cocky if I just say, I'm good at communication. (laughs) That seems cocky to me when I hear it coming out of my mouth. I'm much more comfortable saying, I just can't articulate on the spot like I'd always been able to do. I have to think for a while to find and write down my thoughts before I talk. And I try to listen, but I just can't remember what people tell me. And I have to ask them to repeat themselves. This is what's going on in my life right now around communication, listening and talking. I feel, I feel like voicing my struggles and my deficits fits me better than wearing confidence. You know, if I have two pieces of clothing in my closet, one is, uh, talking about my struggles and my deficits, and the other one is confidence, I feel like talking about my struggles and deficits fits me better. However, if I just constantly am focused on 
these deficits and my limitations, the stuff I'm struggling with, I'm inviting self-criticism. I'm teetering on the edge of saying, I'm not a, communi- I'm not a good communicator anymore. Um, but this isn't true. I am a good communicator. I just have to work harder now, a whole lot harder than I used to. But I'm a hard worker, you know? I'm a hard worker. And so I keep returning back to positive because even in that short little time period, I just said, um, I'm teetering on the edge of saying I'm not a good communicator anymore. And then I followed that up by saying, but this isn't true. I am a good communicator. And then I followed that by saying, but I have to work harder at it, which which pulls me back down to this, oh, wah, wah, you know. And then I pull myself back up and say, but I'm a hard worker, you know. So it's so easy in one sentence to pull yourself up and push yourself down. And that is what I keep doing. And I wanted to talk about it. And the first step for me in all of this is to continue to talk about how I'm feeling. And I'm hoping that with this episode, I will pull myself back up again. And I actually did reach out to somebody today and voiced my um, need for making an appointment with a psychotherapist to talk about my feelings a little more um, in private because I do feel like I need it. So, um, So that's positive. That's positive. Okay, so that was the first one. The first one was um, downplaying our strengths and talents. Okay, so number two on feeding self-criticism is using shame and guilt to, to motivate ourselves. Using shame and guilt to motivate ourselves. Believe it or not, many of us do this all the time. Think about it. Think about when you are telling yourself to go to the gym or you're telling yourself to do that yoga workout or whatever it is, whatever that exercise thing is that you do. Um, Using shame and guilt as a motivator often involves negative self-talk and self-criticism to push yourself towards your goal. I know there are so many times, um, you know, during the time right before my stroke when I was doing yoga daily, I didn't, it's like I turned my wanter off and I just did it. I did it every day at four o'clock, every day at four o'clock. Kind of like what I'm doing with this podcast. I just do it every day um, at, you know, before bed. So, um, but I, but I know now, like now that I don't have that habit of doing it every day at four o'clock, what I don't even think about whether I want to or not. I have this little bit of like stress, you know, like it's, it's like, oh, you're not, you're lazy. That's the best one I can think of. You're lazy. That's why you're not, that's why you're not doing yoga or, or you're lazy. That's why you're not going to go take a walk. Well, no, I, I'm not lazy. That's not why I'm doing it. It's because I don't feel good. Um, But it's so easy for me to change that, that self-talk over to criticism, you know, over to saying what's not, what's wrong with me. So here's an example. Um, If I don't complete my goal for today, um, then I'm going to criticize myself that I'm lazy, right? 
So my goal today was to walk over to the nail salon, which is, um, I don't know if it's a whole mile, but it might be a mile. It's the longest walk that I do, and I do it like uh, once a month, maybe. And uh, on other days, I get a ride. But um, it's really, it's a big deal for me to walk over there. And I have to be like totally prepared, wear my sunglasses that uh, also have a peripheral view cut off and all of this stuff, wear a hat to block the sun. And um, so I didn't do it today. And it would be easy for me to say, actually, I said to myself, you can't do anything anymore. That seems to be the self-talk. That's the, that's the sentence I keep repeating to myself is you can't do anything anymore. And um, another thing that I thought to myself today is you're so lazy this week. Because I really have been, I haven't even been changing out of my pajamas this week. And this is absolutely not kind. I'm not being kind to myself by saying these things. And it's certainly not motivating me to walk over there and get my nails done. Um, What actually happened was that I went to my stroke survivor support group and then I felt like crap afterwards. That's why I didn't go. So if I were to back up and look at my day, my goal actually was not to go get my nails done. My goal was to go to my stroke survivor support group. And what I did was I gave myself two goals and I'm not supposed to do that. I'm only supposed to give myself one goal a day. And um, this is something that my boyfriend and I agreed on, and it just makes sense for my health to uh, not overextend myself and give myself just one goal per day. And it seems like there are a lot of times that I look at this idea of having one goal that it just seems like so, like I'm not achieving anything big in my life. You know, I'm so used to like, doing so much in one day. So to have one goal is just kind of poor me. There it is again, you know, you can't do anything anymore. And um, so a healthier motivation strategy, of course, is to do positive reinforcement, self-compassion, and understand the root of why we may not achieve a goal, you know, our goal for the day. Um, Just because I didn't complete my goal, what I thought was my goal, going to get my nails done, um, shouldn't define my entire week. You know, if I analyze what I did, um, like I just did, I can instead stop self-criticizing and instead find a way to create realistic goals and get back to what works in my life. And doing more than one thing in a day doesn't work in my life, unfortunately. So I deserve a break. And I deserve to comfort myself um, because, you know, I, today was a rough day with my head after my support group. I feel like I have rubber bands wrapped around my head. And I feel that a lot, but today was especially, um, there were more rubber bands today than, than normal. And, um, and I, and I was nauseous all afternoon and I just deserve to give myself a break. Um, I don't do that a lot and it's just much more beneficial to give myself positive affirmations, um, realistic goals and remind myself of what my limitations are. And what my strengths are, because I still have strengths. 
They're just not the same as they used to be, or I have to work harder at them. So next time I won't set a goal that requires more from me than I'm physically than I'm physically capable of. And um and I think it's important for me to keep telling myself today that my goal was that stroke support group meeting after all. Um, so number three is having higher standards for ourselves than for others. So I can really, this resonates with me. I might be setting some higher standards for myself in my stroke recovery in several ways. Um, I have a variety of hobbies and interests like gardening and sewing and yoga and uh, painting and all kinds of stuff <laughs> that I'm, it's a growing list. And while these are fun and healthy creative activities for me, um, expecting myself to engage at, with them at my pre-stroke level is putting too much pressure on myself, especially considering the challenges that I have with my vision um, problem and my headaches. Um, my commitment to the podcast and something that keeps kind of screaming at me in the back of my mind is this memoir that I want to write. And so I, I'm clearly highly driven. And that is, I think, an admirable trait to have. But I have to balance these goals, these personal goals professional almost goals, um, I have to balance it with the time and effort that my condition may require um, and so that I don't lead to creating unrealistic goals. And then given my active lifestyle before my stroke, including working more than eight hours a day, um, hiking, kayaking, I am measuring my current progress against my past abilities. And it's important for me to recognize that recovery is a process and um, it's a marathon not a sprint. And it's okay if I'm not able to do everything I used to be able to do. Um, I'm, I'm getting more comfortable saying, saying that, that I can't do the things I used to be able to do. But I'm not necessarily able to say that without feeling sorry for myself quite yet. I keep expecting like some sort of poof recovery to happen and I'm not taking into account the unpredictability of stroke recovery. Every stroke is different and every recovery is different and my boyfriend and I were talking about it this evening actually. He was he said that somebody from work was asking him how I was doing and and they started talking about how um, different having a stroke is from most everything that um, that is a severe injury to our bodies because it can reveal itself afterwards like your impairments and and so and so forth look so different. You know, I was in the sp support group today and there's me who can't look at the screen, although I keep, I kept looking and I'm not supposed to, which is probably why I had that terrible afternoon. But, um, 
there's like somebody in there who doesn't have the use of his hand. There's somebody in there who has weakness in his face. There's other people who um, are learning, you know, to walk again. And uh, there's there's a, an individual who can't talk. Um, and so they're all so different. Um, and we were talking about how, you know, some folks were saying it's a long road, but you will recover. You will recover. And all I kept thinking was, will I? You know, will I? I don't know if I actually will. And there are people who, um, who don't, who don't recover, you know, don't, don't recover all the way, don't recover hardly at all. You just don't know. There's no way to tell. And, um, you know, you guys who've been traveling on this journey with me for the past six months with the podcast know that I'm confused as to whether I say accept my disability or I keep fighting, (laughs) you know, when I don't know what's wrong with me. Being in recovery uh, as an alcoholic since 2016 I might be placing a bit of additional pressure on myself to maintain sobriety and, and, and by that, I mean, maintain sobriety emotionally as well as physically. And my emotional sobriety feels like it's really being tested right now. And, and that's okay. I don't have to do that flawlessly. I just need to not pick up a drink. So, um, and then as a mother and a partner in a long-term relationship, I definitely hold myself to high standards in these roles and um, strive to, to provide support and maintain the dynamics that I have had since before the stroke. And that becomes challenging. And I think that my family is being super generous with their support and, you know, and patient with me. I'm not being patient with myself, you know. So, Balancing all of these aspects while managing my recovery is challenging and it's important to give myself grace and understand that it's okay to adjust my expectations and pace myself according to my current abilities and energy levels. And I need to recognize and celebrate small achievements in my recovery and in other areas of my life and try to be more compassionate towards myself. And number four, okay, this is the last habit of feeding that we may be doing that feeds self uh, (laughs) self-criticism. There it is. Um, and that is trying to control things outside of my control. And I could be attempting to control aspects that are out of my control, particularly in the context of this stroke recovery. So, recovery from a neurological event like a stroke is unpredictable, like I was talking about earlier. And it varies from person to person, like I was talking about earlier. And I feel like I, like probably a lot of other stroke survivors, am trying to control the speed and the extent of my recovery, expecting it to follow a specific timeline. That is for sure me. I have these timelines that are set set for me 
by insurance, by doctors, you know, the insurance company's like, okay, well, we need to make sure that we have your, um, your neuropsychiatric evaluation report in January, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I, you know, it just, it puts a lot of pressure. It feels like that, that to me. And I can't control if the neuropsychiatric report doesn't come in time. You know, uh, it did. This is an example that it did. But but there's so many examples where, um, you know, when I was waiting for long-term disability to be approved, things were not falling in the timeline that was set for me. Um, and... I almost want my recovery to fall into some sort of timeline so I know what's happening. And it just doesn't do that. So um, attempting to control this is, is just pointless because it's influenced by biological and medical factors that I that are beyond my control. There's nothing that I can do. You know, all I can do is my best, you know. And after my stroke, there were, you know, there's all these limitations. And while some sort of rehabilitation may work, and it may help me regain something as far as maybe my memory or uh, being able to find the words a little easier, um, some of these things may be permanent. And attempting to regain all of my abilities is, again, another example of trying to control something that's uncontrollable. Um, I just don't know what's going to happen. It's hard, man. It's hard. Think about the things that happen in your life that you have no control over. And, and, (laughs) And think about putting yourself in the position where that is the most important. Your whole life depends on that thing that you can't control. That's what I'm in right now. That's the position that I'm in right now. Um, And then what else can I not control? So I'm setting goals for my podcast and my memoir that I'm writing. And although that's super commendable that I have all of these creative outlets and but it's unpredictable as far as how to set a goal for completing something that requires my vision and I may have a bad day I may have four bad days quite often when I have a bad day it's usually followed by three more bad days It's usually four days before my head stops hurting when it gets to a certain threshold. So I need to be very lenient with myself if I, I think it's important to have goals, but not rigid deadlines because I need to account for the variability in my, in my abilities and my pain. Um, And then having specific expectations of others. I feel like when I get frustrated with myself, then I turn outward and want somebody else. You know, it's like, how can I articulate this? It's like, when I can't control what's happening with my health, I almost start, it appears as though to me like it's some kind of like blaming the loved ones around me for not doing this or that for me. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it causes me having my own internal turmoil causes me to react to those around me in negative ways. And I want to control how they are reacting to me 
if I'm having a bad day. And honestly, today, my boyfriend knew I was having a bad day. I could tell that he knew I was having a bad day. And I could tell that he did everything in his power to help me stay positive and enjoy our time together. I saw it. I felt it. I loved it. And I just appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. He didn't have to say anything. He just worked really hard to encourage me and make sure that he could take away some of my frustrations. And that means the world to me that he is able to just see that um, in me and just start reacting, you know, or responding, I should say, and adapting in order to, um, to ultimately, it, if not cheer me up, keep me from sinking lower. So I don't expect that from him on a regular day. And what's, what's unfortunate is that if I'm having a bad day, I may start expecting that from people around me. And that's not fair. You know, I can't control other people. So um, recognizing what is and what isn't within my control um, can be liberating for me and reduce unnecessary stress. And it often involves accepting uncertainty and variability. So especially in the areas of my help. So focusing on what I can influence, my reactions, my mindset, and the small steps that I take each day is definitely a more effective and fulfilling approach. So that's all I have for you today. Um, Thanks for listening, and I'm just going to keep plugging away and keep smiling. Put the smile on my face, and the smile on the inside will come. That's what I always say. I'll talk to you tomorrow.